as we wait for people to join us, let's uh, see what I do this week. Wait, rotate the device. No, don't rotate the device. Leave the device as is. Okay, okay. What did we draw in this one this week? So, this is the stuff that we drew. Was it last week? Yeah, this was last week. We ended up with a little octopus dude. We drew a fox. And we discovered the importance of having reference as your drawings. But today, we... Oh, and I drew a little ice cream dude. A little ice cream puppy for our company. Uh, I work for a company called Puppy Dogs and Ice Cream. And I got put in charge of uh, creating some merchandise stuff. So I'm going to be doing some fun drawings like that. But tonight, I didn't really plan out a theme. So we're going to be drawing faces and heads. And if you all have questions or have any topics that you would like to see drawn, let me know. And maybe we will take you up on it. Hello, everybody. Uh, Jaden Stuff says hello. Fries Morrison says hey. And my lovely assistant, Marianne, it will be with us for a short while. So say hi, Marianne. Hello. She says hello. Yeah, talk up. Hello. There you go. All right. So let's just draw a couple faces. And then uh, if you all have a theme in mind that you want to see drawn or just have a random thing that you want to see, uh, just put it in the comments. So let's see. How to draw faces. So for all of you that have not seen my tutorials or my other videos about how to draw faces, I recommend that you do because I have a couple different methods that help explain how your face is drawn and how to break it down into simple shapes for different skill levels. So I'm going to explain where I'm at right now and the little things that I've been discovering lately that have helped me and we hopefully that helps some of you. Okay, so I have learned and come to understand that starting off with a sphere is not the most efficient way to draw a head. To me, this shape right here has been the most efficient lately. And it looks like a rounded cylinder on top into like a bullet looking shape on the bottom. And that's how I break it down. The top part and then the jaw. So anything below this will be considered the range of where the mouth can open. So if it's closed, it'll be considerably smaller. If it's open, it's going to come down more. This is the area of the face that moves. So I don't like to put it in the same structure as the parts of the head that don't move. So I've been breaking it down like that. And, you know, when I'm just drawing a normal face, I'm going to just draw half of it. And then I'm going to show you what structure I, you know, normally use when I'm thinking of this. So the first thing that I do is I draw the essence of my the facial expression that I want. In this case, maybe I want super really big eyes, really big eyebrows. So the general like gesture of it would be something like that, right? And then once I have the lines and the sketch and the flow that I really think will fit uh, the facial structure or the face shape that I want or the gesture, at that point, I start mapping out the other parts of the, you know, of the face. And if you're wondering, every single time that I'm drawing shapes like this, I'm not just seeing lines. I'm imagining the structure as a 3D shape. Like everything that I draw lately, I've been trying to put the, th like the thought of adding three-dimensionality to the shapes that I'm drawing, even if it's super simple shapes. So in my head, even though I drew just 
super simple lines, in my head I see all this extra detail because I'm imagining the shapes inside. So you see this at first, but all that information is in there because that's, you know, like eventually your brain just starts mapping out like the things that you draw so often. So if it's something that doesn't change much and you draw it over and over and over and over again, you tend to learn more and that muscle memory stays in there. So you can progress to learning a different part of the body. Uh, let's see. Would you be so kind as to be my moderator? Yeah. How do you want me to do it? Uh, you can do it from my iPad, which is right there, or from the computer, or from your phone. If you can just go onto the, the live stream. All right. So <laughs> I think uh, my assistant almost got taken out by by Stitch. Uh, almost took out here. <laughs> Just swipe to you. All right. Anyways, coming back to it, uh, we are going to start visualizing things like that, right? And then I start mapping out different parts of the face depending on what I see. Uh, this simple shape right here allows me to map out the top part as the eyebrow ridge. I know that the cheekbone is going to be coming in right here and it cuts in. If uh, you want the person to be, you know, like very skinny or very uh, athletic, you know, enhanced cheekbones actually help. So that shape already provided that piece of information as well. And then the cheekbone connects to where the jaw and the nose would go. So if you follow that line, you end up where the middle of the nose cavity would be. And then the nose is just on top of that. So it's just the shape that fits on top of that nose cavity. Then from there, I know that the nose is connected to the uh, top of the jaw, and the jaw is shaped something like this. So I know that the mouth has to be in that general range. Right? And then the bottom jaw... If you see it as a, you know, semi-proper anatomy, like an anatomical study, comes in from a little bit underneath where the cheekbone is. And then it curves in. And then your teeth are inside right there. But they end up doing this shape, which simplifies to just this. The simple L shape that you all, you know, love. All that information comes from the jawbone changing direction. That little point right here, that's the curvature right there. And this starts making sense when you start seeing things as semi-3D objects. Let's say these are like boxes. Right? And that could be how you break down the bottom part of your jaw. Jaden Stuff says, hello. Denise Morrison says, hey. Drawing Gamer 93 says, hey. Joshua Graham says, could you draw spooky mushrooms with a mushroom, ghost, and whoa, like scary face emoji? <laughs> okay, okay, so scaredy phase emoji. So, oh, and then a mushroom. And a ghost. A mushroom ghost? Okay, he mushroom asked, ghost. He asked spooky <laughs> mushrooms, but then put those emojis. Okay, so there you go. That's an emo uh, a ghostly mushroom ghost. <laughs> and then we're going to give it a little bit of color. Oh, where's my watercolor brush? Let's do some real life, real time watercolor action. Uh, 
this is just a super like generic brush thingy for watercolors. This is a wonderful set of watercolors that my lovely lady got me a little while back. Thank you. And you know, for watercolors, especially on this like these Danique sketchbooks, which are really really good for this, uh, you normally just put a little bit of water, test it out. Yeah, it's about the right color that I like. And we're just going to add some color around them because he's a ghost. So he has to be really light. And then watercolor layers really nicely and it gives you a nice, like, fun texture when you let it dry. Whenever it's, like, the most saturated, it just gives you little tiny points so you can make grass. You can make leaves really easy. And then you can just layer the watercolor and then make entire little scenes really, really quickly. And then when you let it dry, you can go over it again and you end up having a really fun contrasty like look to your art. But... All right. Uh, let's continue. Wait, any more comments? Yes. Joshua Cohen says, I wish I could draw with you right now like we used to. Oh, man, yeah. The sketch, uh, you know, sessions at school and stuff like that were awesome. And we're caught up. All right. So we have our little mushroom dude aside. Uh, let's continue on with the head. Uh, so we left off with the jaw. That's why you get that little bump right there. The cheekbone is why you get those little bumps, especially when you're like drawing three quarter. You see that little bump that, you know, anime characters and comic book characters have right here, that little bump. These little bumps are not a mystery. These little bumps are not stylization. These little bumps are to indicate where your bro, like brow muscle is, like this big area, and where your cheekbone exudes from the side of your face when you turn around. So the only reason that I'm overemphasizing the importance of this is because it took me years to figure out this. Like I was always, I always thought that just drawing characters with that little sushi part, you know, would be like, hey, yeah, that's like cool. That just looks awesome. It looks like, you know, like the stuff I see on TV. But I never really understood why there was a little dent. And I didn't understand that the curvature of the forehead came because, you know, like a certain angle from the skull and like everything else is actually mapped out according to anatomy, but it's just distorted. And I didn't know that. And it took me forever to figure it out. So hopefully this clarifies it for some of you and then you guys can move on and create awesome artwork. All right, so after I establish where my mouth is, the nose is, that gives me a little bit of space from here to here. That is my nose bridge. Now, the nose bridge is pretty interesting because the nose bridge, when you're drawing from, let's say, my profile side, right? The nose bridge normally breaks right where your eyes are or a little bit above them. So you can normally categorize the middle of your eyes where the nose bridge curves in. Then the nose bridge comes out, comes back in, and then you get the nostrils, which are just little boxes or spheres that are next to the you know nose then the cheekbone is that same cheekbone that curves around it curves around the front right here as well normally leads to where your eye socket was right and then you have the bottom part of your face. You know where your cheekbone is, so you should know that the jaw comes off from a little bit behind that. You draw that into the chin, and then it just gives you 
the mapping out of every part of your face. It's so think about anatomy like a puzzle. Uh, the more that you understand it, the more that you can make a more complicated puzzle. So let's say that you finally mastered how to, you know, draw a face by mapping out uh, something into fourths and then just drawing faces. You know, so let's say that you master this. Once you master this and you understand how this works, you can start adding different elements. You can start adding eyebrows. You can start adding, you know, teeth, eyelids, facial hair, ears, you know, everything builds up from that. But as you progress as an artist, you're going to hit a part, a part where you just don't know what the next step is. And in order to progress from that, you have to dig into the actual knowledge of what you're drawing. So if you want to progress in your anatomy and your posing and your, you know, like action poses, you need to go look at what other people did and study it, not just redraw it. You need to study it and see how they're doing it, what they're breaking and try to figure it out uh, as much as possible. You'd be surprised how many artists actually are willing to help out people that ask them. Um, it's not just me. So, you know, do your research. And if you really want to learn how to, like, you know, get better from the position that you're in, you know, uh, do research into real life studies. Um, I'm not saying that by any means this is like anatomically perfect <laughs> at all, but the cartooniness of it is based off real anatomy. So it comes off looking a little bit more detailed and honestly, it takes away a lot of the guesswork that comes along with, oh, is this eye supposed to be here? Oh, is the eye too big? The eye too small? Eventually all that like just stops being a concern because you understand where things fit. So continue on with the face. Now, do we have comments? Uh -huh. um, Jaden Stuff said, can you make a skeleton in armor with bone in armor? <laughs> a skeleton with armor? With a bone and arrow. A bow and arrow. A bone and arrow. A bone and arrow. Okay. All right, we'll do that after I finish explaining uh, the face. And we'll do it like with uh, watercolor real fast. Uh, I've learned that uh, sketching with watercolor is really fun. Uh, okay, so let's say that we want to come up with uh, the actual eyeball, the, the part in the middle, that part that everybody loves to stylize. So when I'm drawing my faces, I have a general big shape for the overall shape of the, the mood. And then inside of that, I draw another sphere. And this second sphere is where I draw my eyeball. Now, if I just want to have like a wide eyed open my character, I just thicken the line on the top of the circle, a little bit underneath as well. And then I establish a little bit of the eyelid. That's normally all I do for my, my characters. Now, if I wanted to have that same feel, but I wanted them to be angry or something, the initial shape would be something that looks more angry, followed by the sphere inside. And always imagining this like if it's a Dixie cup or like a drinking cup. And you have a ball inside. Right. And then when you like push down that brow line, essentially you're just squeezing into that Dixie cup, but that's that sphere is still inside. So that's the only part that you would see. Right. I don't know that that's just the easiest way that I can uh, explain like overlapping shapes in the facial expressions. And it's been really useful for me to map that out. This also provides you the perfect shading 
for underneath the eyes. <laughs> and it also helps you like map out the rest of the face really quickly because this little area right here tends to be where the nose is. The nose will then lead you to the general area where the mouth would be, which is in between the cheeks that come from the side of the nostrils. And then you just continue with your drawings. And then you just end up getting a lot quicker because there's no guesswork anymore. After you get to a certain point in your studies, you'll understand how people could break down anatomy before and you were, you know, you know, marveled by it. You end up understanding how they stylize their work and then your range also increases a lot. So you can, the more you understand, the easier it is going to be to come up with any styling that you want or replicate somebody else's art. Not that you kind of want to aim for that, but, you know, if that's your goal, if you really, really want to draw like somebody, that's, that's the way to do it. It's not necessarily just copying their art. You got to, like, understand the, the things that they're drawing and the way that they're drawing it so that you can replicate it better. So let's see. This also provides all the shading that you need. Um, since you already mapped out most of the face, just end up shading the parts that are mapped out. And you end up with a pretty good general guideline for a fun illustration. A good stepping stone into like a next level of detail. So you can already see like just mapping that out, even with shades or with lines, but any way that you want to do it, uh, it's really, really, really cool and really easy once you learn those basic parts. And okay, so a skeleton with armor with a bone and arrow. That's a weird one. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to play with my watercolors because I have been having a blast with them. And we're going to start off with just saturating some blue. I feel like this has to be like the color that we draw this in. Uh, let's come up with a little blobby for skull. We're going to come up with like a big gesture for how we want the character to be standing. I kind of want him like hulking a little bit, even though he's a skeleton. Then we're going to draw a general idea where the rib cage would go. Now we're going to draw where the spine would connect to the hips and see what I mean like understanding a tiny bit of anatomy like allows you to draw things very very quickly and like very effectively so it is worth the time of uh, dedicating to to getting better at it because in the long run like you're just going to excel over everybody that get into it might take a while, yeah, but normally that's the case. All right, so we have that. Then we know that the hip, I know that my hip bone sticks out a little bit, and it comes back in. I know that that's the general approach for that part of that bone. So we're going to just draw that in. And then we're going to give him some bracers. And he's going to be walking through Swampland because we ran out of room. As, as Bob Bros would say, happy accidents, happy accidents. I'm dragging on stilts and assembly. Doesn't matter. You're here. That's all that matters. If you guys come to my stream, even if it's late, 
It makes my night. Thank you. Cal Stewart asked how to make an eye not look shocked or surprised. Mine always look wide open no matter how big I make the color in black. Draw eyelids. <laughs> if, if you want the eye closed, you gotta draw some eyelids. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do a really quick one. Okay, so let's do it on this page. If you want to draw eyes that don't look shocked, like in shock, let's say you want you have a couple eyes, right? If your eyes looking shocked, like oh no, ah, like that, no, like super crazy eyed. First, first step, make the inside of the eye a little bit bigger. Yeah, you were on the right path. You make it a little bigger. If you add a fill to it, instead of having the pupil in the middle, it also takes away a little bit of the element. But the element of surprise doesn't come from the size of the eye. It comes from the eyelids. You can make someone worried, you can make someone angry, you can make someone happy by just changing the bottom eyelid. You can make someone look super giddy like, yay! You know, something as simple as that can change that. If you want someone to look really, really like disturbed, just do one eyelid and then like the eyebrow line coming down and then just super tiny like eyebrows. Uh, no, no, eyeballs. So the size of the actual part in the middle plays a very big role when it comes down to like the level of cuteness. But it doesn't really work all that much to showing that a character doesn't look surprised. For that, try not giving characters round eyes. Do them like, you know, ovals. If you want them to look really serious, just like have half their eye closed. You know, put the eyelid on top. Uh, so playing, again, learning the anatomy... <laughs> Again, I'm going to emphasize this every single time I draw. Learning the anatomy, knowing that you have the upper eyelid, the lower eyelid, that the eyelids actually have depth. So it's more like this with like depth and thickness to the eyelid. You know, like levels, remember, levels. At first you see an eye and a little ball in the middle. Then you see an eye and the cornea. Then you see an eye and you see an eyelid. And then you see, you know, the bevels of the eyelid and the overlapping shapes with the edges of your eye and then the lower eyelid and then how the eyelashes connect. And they don't connect to the inside line of the bevel, they connect to the outside line of the bevel. And it just, you know, it's just a really uh, a progressive stepping stone thing. And you need to learn this so you can understand this so you can understand the next. And then, you know, it just progresses to like understanding shading and shadows and how that shape connects to everything else. And then it's just, but you got to be patient, but you have to push forward in every step. Like you ought to understand that once you, once you know this step, once you perfect it, look for the next level. Once you get to that next level, look for the next level. And then that's always going to progress you forward and you're gonna be really, 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 really happy that you did it. But let's get back to our skeleton. That also gave time for the, <laughs> for the watercolor to dry a little bit, so it's gonna be easier to draw. Reader said, hi, what's up? Hey, what's up? Mewtwo3291 asked, have you ever drawn anything that got you in trouble? Uh, have I drawn anything that got me in trouble? I mean, I've almost gotten fights, and uh, I've been fired from places for drawings. There you go. <laughs> I guess that would be trouble. <laughs> yeah. uh, in one of my jobs, I worked in production. 
And unfortunately, uh, this was when I was like, maybe like 19, 20. And I made a mistake in the production and it costs, you know, the company a considerable amount of money. Uh, I was let go. Uh, but the boss was a jerk, so I didn't really care too much. Plus, I was like in that like moment of exploration where I just wanted to like try everything that I could in order to like understand what you know like place in the field in the market that I wanted to like end up in. So I, I didn't really care too much. So I don't know if that would be like trouble if you don't really care. Right. Weavers said, can you make a Puppet Master Mario? A Puppet Master Mario. Well, let's see how much time we have after we... How about you guys just tell me things to add to this scene? Okay? L let's just keep it at that. I know it's going to take a while for like you guys to catch up. But just tell me things to add to this scene. So far, we have a skeleton with armor with a bone and arrow. <laughs> So we need a bone and arrow. Brandon Madding said, hey, what's up? Do more sketchbook tours. More sketchbook tours. I do. OK. I do need to like upload because I have like, I think I have like three that I have not uploaded or like done anything yeah, with. Yeah, you have like three new ones. That yeah, I, I need to. I need to do one for you all. Kale Stewart said, thanks for the tips and for the help on figuring out my tiger's body issues I was having. It helped out a lot. Sweet. Glad I could help. Funny Porn Swag 487 said, hey, Rodgon, I have low confidence in my drawings. Do you have any advice on overcoming this feeling of doubt? Ah, the ever-present question of, uh, of that. So a lot of times the insecurity that comes from, you know, like thinking that your art isn't good is because someone in your life at some point or another told you something negative about your artwork. Now, if you begin to try to analyze why you feel so negative about, you know, showing your work and the confidence level, um, you'll start to like understand a little bit more and try to maybe get past that. But I'm not a psychologist and I don't really, you know, like know your particular situation. So I don't like to generalize. So what I'm going to do instead of telling you, you know, what is causing it, I'm going to tell you how freaking amazing each one of you guys are for being able to draw absolutely anything. And if you do not get inspired by this, do not let me know because it's like my, my, my grade A material right here. Like, so let me explain to you all how amazing all of you are for being able to draw in general. The fact that you can actually put a piece of material into another piece of material and create something unique and artistic with a vision, that's pretty damn awesome. You know why? Because you're essentially creating something that was never there before. That is a, an idea. That is an imaginative thought. And no one else is going to have the exact one. Now, my lovely lady here would probably kill me for saying this. <laughs> but during college, um, I had this notion that if my art was not unique, I, it, it just wasn't worth doing. So that's why I stayed away from realism so much. Because I thought that the better you got with realism, the more your stuff would look like everybody else that was a master at it. It just made complete sense in my head. I was a very, very naive kid, <laughs> but that was like my overall thriving opinion for years, years. 
And these are years that I could have uh, improved exponentially if I didn't have that, that mentality. So, the, first of all. I mean, I can't blame you. I was kind of the same way, but opposite. Like, I always thought that realism art was the best form and that, you know, like, cartoon was easy. <laughs> so I kind of brushed that off. Now, can you please tell them how hard it is to go from being a incredibly realistic like artist to trying to draw super cartoony stuff? I found that when I tried to do simple shapes, I couldn't. I kept on adding textures and I kept on adding shadows, more line work, and it did not end up as a cartoon. It ended up looking like a very sketchy, but not on purpose, <laughs> just too many lines, too much things going on cartoon. That doesn't necessarily look good with cartoons if you don't know how to do it right. So exactly. it didn't look like a good cartoon. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> um, it's very hard to do it right. See? I always think that it's much easier for a person that learns cartooning early to learn realism to a certain extent than it is for a person that is incredibly like focused in hyper realism to draw super simple. And it's because it's really hard to train your eye to not see detail. It's like asking an adult to draw like a kid. Right. And it's not very easy. It's it's a very difficult concept sometimes. It is very difficult. Um, just especially what I've noticed too is just like with emotions and expression. On the base core of it, it's really it in theory should be simple. <laughs> you know In theory, right? <laughs> in theory. Because you have the eyebrows, which is a big focal point to show emotion, and mouth. Every, everywhere else kind of just works around those two things. Mm-hmm. Because the eyebrows squish down, affects the eyes, um, the mouth, kind of ties all in together. Um, so if you break that down to a really, really simple smiley face form, you know, you can show emotion, like, pretty easy if you know how to do that. It's really hard to learn and to simplify that. <laughs> Like, when you try to draw that with your characters and then keep it simple, it's still really hard. So she came to uh, understand how like difficult it was after she started uh, going out with me. <laughs> and it was awesome seeing her, like, explore that side of art for, like, probably, like, some of the first times. Yeah. And seeing somebody that's so talented... Uh, struggle a tiny bit with the simplicity of the cartooning uh, was really, really uh, interesting to see because I I did not understand fully like how difficult it was until she started explaining why it was difficult. Now I gotta get you to start doing realism. <laughs> I'm more more likely to do it now than I would have like been like. A month ago. Even a month ago. Really? Yeah. What changed? Like, I'm seeing a huge exponential growth in my my knowledge base just by practicing a little bit more uh, observation. Well, you know what I've noticed? The base core, and don't attack me, guys. <laughs> it's just my opinion. The base core of realism, for me, is just shading. Mm -hmm. Like... You don't have to be good at line work. You don't have to be good at lines. It really doesn't have very many lines. Like, at the, its core, realism is shape. I mean, there's no lines in realism. It's, right. it's just contrast between right. the shapes, right? So then you go into cartooning, and there's not a lot of shading. <laughs> so if you're really good at realism and shading, you're kind of like, well, throw that out the door here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so what I what I mean is that each one has its highlights of skills. Mm -hmm. So realism has the shading, and then for cartoon, 
It's more line work, I noticed. It's a lot of line work and the uh, like heaviness of the line work and line work and then uh, colors. Yeah. So I feel like those are huge fundamentals of cartooning. And so between realism and cartoons, those are complete different art sets and skills that you have. Oh you yeah. Know? So like you have one artist that excels with shading. You have one that excels in line work. Those are polar opposites. Ah, see, that brings a cool topic that I, I, I like to mention like from time to time. The importance of understanding the different types of jobs that are out there for people with different skill sets. She was mentioning that a lot of the times, you know, there's different specialties for people. Like some people are really good at coloring. Some people are very good at inking. And I'm going to use... Uh, uh, a comic book as an example because it's just something that a lot of you actually want to do at some point and it's something that you know not all of you like i don't even know like a hundred percent of all the different jobs that are within that industry but i understand how the division of labor is made therefore those are the jobs that i know uh there's the person that writes the scripts there's the person that comes up with the concepts for the book then there's the people that draw the book and those are mostly the times like that you, you know like scott campbell and uh scotty young and stuff like that right uh their specialties they have the colorists mm -hmm. for them yeah like each one has their specialty some of them like to do coloring and inking and everything inside their comic but more often than not they hire somebody to do the pencil work then they hire somebody else to do the, you know, the inking, then somebody else to do the coloring, then somebody else to do the formatting, and then somebody else to put everything together, the lettering and stuff like that. A lot of the times, a simple comic will require collaboration from a ton of people. And all those, you know, segments are, you know, jobs that you all could, you know, surveil. And then maybe if you're not a very strong color person, you don't apply for being a colorist. You apply to be a an anchor or a, a go into like storyboarding or something other than that you know you play to your strengths and then you you know feed your career with that while you strengthen those weaknesses so you can achieve what you really want to do any other comments yes g bass asks do you have any classes on any platforms? I have a course on 21Draw, which is geared more towards understanding like how you should start thinking of your concept work and your characters and like how to use reference to empower that and make your artwork stronger. That's one that I have on 21Draw. Uh, I also did stuff for their books, for the instructional books, and I am coming up with a new course for them, and that's coming out next year. And it's going to be about how to draw cute animals. Cute animals by the cute animal master right here. Dragons on stilts said adverts. Adverts? All right. I'll Adverts said spirits floating. Ooh, spirits and birds. All right. Fuzzy Meow said, can you do a sketch night showing us how to draw feet? Or did I miss it? How to draw feet? I don't think I've done feet yet. So, yeah, that sounds like a good one. Mewtwo suggested a sword. Huh, nice. Okay. Art of MJ Fox said, when are we getting the How to Draw Everything book or Zook's comic? Okay, those two are projects that are very much so on my importance list more the book than the zooks comic right now mostly because the i'm still trying to figure out like the base core concepts that are going to be like you know what the jokes are about and like how to like write the structure of the comic you know i'm trying to map out a little bit more than just uh trying to draw a comic and try to match it every week uh maybe it's taking me a little bit too long to release it mostly because i just want it to be perfect and but i i really should start just releasing you know some of the comics that i already have for them 
Yeah, I have like a few. I have like five or six different ones, but I haven't released them yet because I was waiting to understand the idea a little bit more inside my head before I did that. Brandon Madding said, your sketchbook tours is how I found the channel. <laughs> nice. So I think they really want you to do more sketchbook tours. All right. Maybe next stream I'll do feet and a little sketchbook tour. Or maybe I'll just upload it separately. And then treat you guys to two videos. John Gilland said Little Dragon. A little dragon? Yeah, I can do a little dragon. Dr. C said just got in but already giving a thumbs up. You always brighten my evening. Aww. See? That's the reason that I've been able to keep this up for like a month and a half. I think it's been like a month and a half, two months or something like that. Um... Comments like that just make my night. <laughs> it's really nice to hear stuff like that. John Gillen said, I'm that way, trying so hard to keep my stuff clean and cartoon. It is hard. Tell him, honey. Agreed. <laughs> uh, Dr. C said, like rendering and shading, depends on your style, it seems. Ivan Soriano said, damn, she's right. <laughs> Dr. C said, that's cool monster already. You should stop there. You No, you could stop oh, there. Oh, I'm like, what? <laughs> you could stop there, and my mind has already finished it. Oh, awesome. <laughs> uh, Gabriel Glover said, thank you, man, for getting me back into drawing and art in general. I'm so happy to hear stuff like that. Because I don't think anybody should give up. Like, I mean, okay. There's, like, the avenue for art that will lead you to have like a career doing it and you know like doing art as a living but honestly as if you end up losing that love for the art or for the actual like you know act of drawing and creating and coming up with fun stories if you end up losing that by making it your job like i don't know if i would take that i won't i don't know if i would take that deal um honestly like i do this because i absolutely love it uh, you know for a long long time after i got out of college you know i didn't get paid much for it i wasn't making a living doing this so it really really took uh that passion like that little passion that i had for it and not to let it go like, it would have been really easy for me to go into something else like sales or, you know, real estate or something like that because I'm a good salesman. I'm a good talker. I, you know, so, but nothing ever caught my attention as much as creating art. And that is the reason that I'm so passionate about it. And that's also the reason that I, you know, like to try to at least. Uh, make everybody's like inspiration levels go through the roof because i want everybody to and you know see it like i do apple by illustration said have you ever thought about doing a course on skillshare skillshare huh um i get asked enough to be on different platforms i think i i got asked to be on domestica and there's another one that was in um uh, Remember the one that I told you it was like you like Ukraine or something like that? They wanted to like fly me out there? Yes. Well, yeah, there's been a couple of different people that have been, you know, asking for me to create content for them. But I think they're saying for yourself. Oh, for myself? Oh, I, uh, I'm <laughs> I'm in need of like assistance. <laughs> I need like you know, people that will just, like, help me create or help me manage all the time-consuming stuff so that I could focus on, like, more big-picture stuff for myself. Like, I wish that I was at a point where I could, like, get that and, like, be able to, like, afford that, right? Like, have a little, like, mini studio where I can be like, you go take care of my groceries. I'm going to draw all day. I'm going to create six comics today. Someone feed me. <laughs> that would be that would be pretty pretty fun. I think that would uh, increase my production a lot. 
Cody Corn Swag 487 said, favorite type of music genre? Ah. Oh. Okay, so I am stuck in the 90s. I like Limp Bizkit. I like Eminem. I like Offspring, Blink-182. A lot of a lot of dubstep. I really, really enjoy dubstep. Um, what else do I like? What else do I like? A lot of old stuff, but like not classics, just like out of date stuff. <laughs> oh, a lot of like uh, Mexican uh, classic rock. God, it's classic rock now. Like it wasn't classic rock when I liked it. <laughs> it was like the normal radio stuff. But now it's classic rock. Dr. C said you have to pull like a Todd McFarlane. And create my own comic book industry. <laughs> Apple by illustration said, Oh, and thanks for helping with my traveling sketchbook. Yeah, I, I still need to send that out to the next artist, but I will get it done this week. And we're caught up on comments for the moment. All right. Well, let's take a second here to say thank you to my lovely assistant. It's always wonderful when she gets to join me on the stream. And luckily, she finished an amazing tattoo really, really quickly so she could be here with me. So let's all say thank you to Marianne. Oh, what a lovely smile. But that's for me only. You guys don't get to see that. <laughs> you guys get to see this. Let's see. Okay, so at this point, I'm just drawing uh, like the basic parts and then just letting my imagination uh, see the little blotches and everything as different elements in the, in the drawing. And then if I can manage to get that to look okay, then it ends up coming out like shading. And it just comes off really, really fun. And it adds an element of randomness to your artwork that normally doesn't happen. When we structure everything so much, we lose like an element of, uh, of fun to a lot of our art. When we like try to have perfect lines or we worry so much about having like the right concept down or like, you know, trying to follow like a client's guidelines, like way too much. Like sometimes it's just, it takes away the fun of things. So I like adding little elements of randomness to my art as much as I can, especially when I'm just sketching for fun. Like, because that's freedom. That's to me, that's like the best. I get to draw what I want, have a little bit fun exploring, like maybe something that I didn't understand before and grow a little bit as an artist every single time I put a pencil down. Okay, so what's the hardest thing that you've learned lately? Huh? Spanish. Oh yeah, Marianne is uh, picking up Spanish, and she's getting good at it. Am I? Yeah. <laughs> she can have a conversation now, and now if I like call her something silly in Spanish, she she'll like smack me because she'll she'll know. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta learn another language to talk shit now. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you have to learn like, I don't know, like German or something. I don't know if I could have said that on YouTube live. Should, I should have bleeped myself. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone saying thank you, gracias. Uh, Vince said hey. Fuzzy Meow said thanks for doing these. I look forward to this. You explain things in such a relatable and understanding way. You are appreciated. Oh. Well, I try. Vince Bernie George said, I see you sketching a lot. Do you have anything going on projects at the moment? And how do you overcome procrastination? Overcoming procrastination, huh? 
Uh, well, project-wise, I just finished my pinup book, which I need to format uh, and get ready, maybe hopefully to get it out to all of you through Amazon or self-publishing by December. So that is going to be my number one project that I want to finish this year, followed by having at least a full structure for my how to draw book so I can release it early in the next year, and as well as the Mr. Depp book. Me and Mr. Depp will be like something like that I've wanted to do ever since last year. So that's also one that I have in the works. And that's going to be like a little, you know, like self-help guide for people with, you know, depression. And so I look really look forward to actually like, fin like starting that up and finishing it because uh, I think it's going to help a lot of people. And it's information that I wish that I had when I was going through it. Even though I'm not like a psychologist or anything. So <laughs> I just an artist. Ivan Soriano said, love the Mr. Depp mini comics. Uh, thank you. Yeah, well, I, got, I mean, my life has uh, not been that bad. Uh, Ever since I came up with them, like things have gotten progressively better because I chose to make it progressively better. And I think honestly, creating a little character like that and uh, visualizing my depression as a little character that I can smush in my drawings, it, it helped out a ton. So yeah, that's like uh, a little technique that I that I came up with without even really knowing, and it's it's helped out a lot. But I want to come up with like an entire book for him. So it's still trying to come up with like the rhyming structure and like how I'm going to present it. But luckily, I work for a kid's book publishing company. So <laughs> the odds of it getting published are pretty high. <laughs> So in this case right now, I'm just trying to draw a little bit of the structure of the hand. Like I know that it's not perfect bone structure around the whole thing. It's super stylized, but I'm like trying to kind of map out a semi, semi uh, correct approach to it. And just having, you know, a general idea of where the things fall helps out with concept sketches like this that are like, you know, not meant to be perfect. They're just meant to, you know, convey an emotion or convey a concept. And the Thanks, Bernie George says, yeah, I will definitely buy it, Mr. Depp. And thanks for reading my comments, Mary. <laughs> You're welcome. And just so you guys know, it's Mary with an I. <laughs> You guys don't want to get on the bad side of this, this little one. Oh, gosh. She'll tattoo, like, something funny on you. <laughs> what is the most difficult animal for you to draw? Huh. Good question. I'm trying to think of a drawing that I tried to draw... How about all you in the comments section? Let us know what your most hated animal to draw is. Um, I have one, <laughs> and I absolutely hate having to draw these for clients or for whenever I draw characters of people and they ask for a drawing of a horse. Oh, God, I hate drawing horses, not because I don't like horses, but because I don't necessarily know off the top of my head how to draw a horse off of, like all the time like it it just has never really registered in my head uh so every time i end up looking like a ridiculously like distorted cow or like a really crazy like wombat or something it just never looks like it's supposed to <laughs> ivan soriano said horse the second before you started talking about horses. <laughs> it must be a universal thing. <laughs> I think for me, 
Not realism, but cartoon dogs. Cartoon dogs. I always make them look like horses. What? I don't know what I do. <laughs> um, but yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. So horses. Cartoon dogs, because they look like horses. Well, See, horses are just a common denominator. Horses have something to do with this drawing looking bad. Maybe just horses are just uh, the worst thing for artists to draw. Dr. C said I can't even draw a circle, man. <laughs> <laughs> drawing Gamer 93 said all the animals. All the animals. Fuzzy Meow said not much animals, but realistic people. Mmm. So we're not going to draw an, uh, a sword. We're going to draw a dagger because there's no, not enough space for a sword. But he can be an assassin with a little dagger. Right here. So where are you all from? I would love to know where all of you are watching me from right now. If you can all leave it in the comments so... Our lovely assistant can, you know, give you guys a little shout out. Let's do it. I have a feeling we're going to have uh, quite a few people from uh, Mexico. Oh, and by the way, by the way, I will be doing a two-hour seminar for Wacom Academy this Thursday. So... If you do speak Spanish and you would like to watch a really cool seminar on accelerated growth using your sketchbook, you should tune in to that. Yeah. And let them know that I sent you so they have me more often. <laughs> Mention my name, comment, and you will see me in a lot more other things. Thanks to all of you. I've been able to participate in a lot of things that without the support of all my followers, I never would have gotten a chance to do, including attending Lightbox as an exhibitor. Uh, and I will forever be grateful to all of you for like allowing me the opportunity to do that thanks to all your comments because I was not even on their radar <laughs> until you guys did. So... This is me thanking all of you. Vince Bernie George said, Hey, Drawing Gamer 93, Detroit. Garbanzo the third, Cali. No. Funny Corn Swag 487, Maryland. John Gullion said, Houston, Texas. Gabriel Glover said, Florida. Dr. C said, Manhattan. Oh, wow. Zumarella, Zumarella said Minnesota. Ivan Soriano said Dominican Republic. Dragons on Stilts said Missouri. Fuzzy Meow said Pennsylvania. And Vince Bernie George said, I'm not even from the U.S. <laughs> well, thank you all so much. Uh, it really means a lot that you spend your Mondays with me, sketching. Uh, I know a lot of people out there don't have the opportunity to draw with other creative people and my goal is to eventually have uh, these sketch sessions so I can stream and you know inform some of you like you know about different topics and also have a, a night where it's an open session where I can teach people or not like we can we can set a topic and then I can help you all through the process of creating that topic but something like that would be more so like uh well like a small session so i'd probably only bring in at the most 15 20 people and then give those people you know a better experience you know so imagine those uh wine and drawing classes but with uh cool illustrations Imagine digital classes where you end up with a cool drawing at the end by following my instructions. I think that'd be really cool. Funny Corn Swag 487 said, Sorry for my long name. I need to change it. <laughs> You're good. 
Uh, Weaver said, I'd love a print of this guy. Oh, wow. Well. Well, I can arrange that if you actually like it at the end. Vince Brain George said, same. He needs to change his username. Well, Twitter. if you guys contact me through Instagram, we can set something up. Just hit me up. Uh, for the print? Mm hmm. JP Pat said, La Peninsula de Yucatan, uh, Mexico, we celebrate a few days of independence with pozole and beers. Oh my god, I miss Mexico pozole. <laughs> oh. You guys just triggered oh. something. Okay. <laughs> oh. I'm so jealous right now. Enjoy that pozole and beers for me, please. Mm. Like, oh, so good. So good. <laughs> Yeah, we we like Mexican food. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we quite like Mexican food. Ivan Soriano said, when inking besides light, do you take anything else in consideration? Okay, when I'm inking, I take into consider the light source, which is going to dictate where the lines are going to be thicker, and also where the contrasting like heavy blacks are going to be. The other thing that I take into consideration is the the thickness of the lines from the front of the drawing, where I want most of the you know like the detail, as opposed to the details in the back. As you will see when I start adding detail to the you know trees and stuff like that, I try to make it with slightly thinner lines, but adding cross hatching to still give that you know like depth that I need it, but without adding super thick lines. That way the detail and the focus is still on this general area but you don't compromise on not showing details in the background because the mind will just fill in all the extra details that your lines don't fulfill especially when you sketch with watercolor because it already has little gradations and like little imperfections that make it look like it's something there so your brain just fills in the gaps Wow, people at work are really, really, really interested in me right now. <laughs> but guess what? I'm with you guys. <laughs> All right, so. John Gillen said, I end up with cool little drawings following these videos. LOL. Hey, if you guys ever do draw alongside me and you all are doing these as well, or you draw the same general concept, or you're just doodling with me at home. Make sure to tag me so I can see them. I would absolutely love, love to see what you come up with. Um, it's a huge, like, you know, like, awesomeness to me to do this. Okay, so now that we have the general idea of the drawing, I'm going to go in and I'm going to add a little bit of a darker watercolor color just to go in and create more contrast between the parts that look too similar. In this case, I see that the helmet is just looks like a running piece of armor. I'm going to make the middle part a little bit darker, and I'm going to give the sides a little bit more color, not black, but a little bit of color, so that it pops out against just the pure black. I'm going to do the same thing with the arms. It doesn't have to be much color, it just has to be enough that it contrasts against the rest and it gives it a little bit of a gradation so it looks a little bit better. Now, when I get better at this, because I honestly, I've only been touching watercolors for like the last six, no, like four or five months, and actually been practicing different things with them. Uh, I assume that it's going to be the same as thing as with uh, highlighters. Eventually, <laughs> things are just going to be really easy to do, and I'm going to be able to experiment a little bit more. So I'm going to be able to do, uh, you know, like little tutorials on how to like, have fun with watercolors and stuff. So those will be videos that I look forward to doing later when I master this a little bit more. Christian Christo says, hey! Hi! I'm awake for the first time for your stream. So happy. 
But I need to leave in a few minutes. Oh, well, it's better that have come and gone than to never have come at all. <laughs> Drawing Gamer 93 said, Marianne, have you thought of having your own YouTube channel? Yes, actually. Um, I am horrible at video editing, though. But I have a lot of content of my travels that I've actually filmed. And I've been wanting to stitch them together for a couple of years now. Of my travels to Mexico, Greece, and uh, just different places here and there that I've been. I would really love to do something on history. Uh, because I'm, I'm really big into history and ancient cultures. So learning about history and the different places that I go to... I would kind of love to do it like a documentary so that I'm able to show people history could be fascinating. It doesn't just have to be old, boring TV programs on the History Channel that throw in aliens. <laughs> you know, like, it can still be relevant and somewhat young and fresh and really just interesting fun facts that I think any, anybody, any walk of life would find interesting. There you go, guys. So we should all encourage her by following her food blog and asking her to uh, talk about the food and her travels and that more. So if you follow uh, Mary Munchies on Instagram, you'll see what I mean. She already has an amazing food blog. Yeah, so travel, food, culture, history... That's, that's what I would really love to base well. Yes, yeah, she loves all that stuff. If you guys had a superpower, what would it be? Funny Corn Swag 487 asked. Ooh. Ooh. See, this, this answer changes quite often for me. But I'll let you go first. Nah, you go first. Okay, I go <laughs> first? All right. Well, if I had a superpower... At first, I always thought that having super speed would be, like, the best thing ever. But the more that I think about it, the more I don't want that. Because if I don't have that superpower paired with, like, super strength, uh, I would just end up going really fast and then just crashing into something and then splattering against the side of a wall. So I often change that result of that. And I now want, uh, I want mind reading. Oh, yeah. Mind reading would be fantastic for a person like me. That would be horrible because, like, everybody thinks rude comments to themselves and then has, you know, a filter. So you would be hearing rude comments nonstop. Like, let's say, um... Like what? Uh, I don't know. I'm trying to think of something. Everybody always filters themselves. It's it. That would be horrible if they didn't. Would it? Yes. See, the thing is, they're still filtering themselves. So I would understand the people that are being fake and phony, and the people that are not. So to me, it would be fantastic because then I can be like, this person's being genuine. I can un- like you know like be around them confidently and not, you know, like have to worry. If a person's just, you know, like, lying from the beginning, you'd be like, aha, I caught you, punk. Okay, so, like, I'll throw out just, like, embarrassing examples. Okay. Like, let's say if you cook, and then it's, like, you know, somebody doesn't want to say, damn, you suck. But, like, they think in their head, god, I would never eat that again. But people wouldn't be that rude if somebody cooked for them. So they're not going to be, like, telling you that. So they keep that to themselves, and then, you know, if you're a polite person, you know, just be like, uh-huh, that's good, or, yeah, we'll try something different. But being polite doesn't necessarily mean being a good person. I know. But so you know I mean? even if they're polite to me, it doesn't mean that I would want to keep them in my life. Like, if they're being rude, regardless of the context, like, even if they're thinking it, I'd rather know it up the front than be like, oh, my God, let her down the line, realize that they're you know, bad people. See, the thing is, I'm not easily offended or easily, like, I understand, like, people's actions have, like, purpose. So, 
I don't know. Uh, I'd rather find the person to be genuine so that I can feel like confident and like, you know, like confident being around them than a person just being polite to be polite. I'd say teleportation. Teleportation? Oh, that's a good one too. Because you could be a superhero or a villain with that. Yeah. So, you know, like, if you kind of want to be out for yourself too, you could do that too. Like, let's say it was your goal to rob a bank. <laughs> you can, like, teleport into a bank and take, like, $10. <laughs> it's like, oh, and, shit, I'm short on my smoothie. Yeah, exactly. I need to buy my Carl's Jr. meal today. <laughs> and then just teleport out. Or how I would use it, travel. But if there's no restriction on travel would it lose like its value to you oh no because you'd be able you you'd see everything you wanted to see within a month no there's so much things in the world because most of the time it, it's the travel in between these things that takes time no if you were like okay i'm gonna go to the louvre boom i'm gonna go to the new york stock exchange boom i'm gonna go to the statue of liberty boom You'd be done with all that in, like, a day. Worse than a theme park, because there's, like, a fast pass to, like, the entire world. You're underestimating my love for history. No, no, no. I'm not saying that you wouldn't want to revisit all these places. I'm not even about revisiting. There's so many pyramids in Mexico that even Chichen Itza should deserve a full day, if not multiple days, if you can spare it. And there's so many more pyramids in Mexico to see. That would not even be a month if I took my time and enjoyed it. Yeah, but you have teleportation. Yeah. Like, do you get tired of going to the store? That's a store. Why is the store not a, a interesting place? Because it's right there all the time, right? No, because it's easy it's to not get history. to. Hey, okay, what if you go to a historical store? I don't know. What historical store, sir? I don't know, like some like old lady, like mom and pop shop or something. I'm trying to make a point here. Christian, <laughs> <laughs> um, Chris, Chris, I'm sorry, I'm butchering your name. Christine Christo said, do you know... Paris Cristal, and if yes, are you inspired by him? Who? <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to like, uh, you know, like be dismissive of people, but I'm not a very, very knowledgeable person as to other people in the art world. Uh, I seclude myself so much and I do my own thing so much that a lot of the times I just don't necessarily have a lot of time to, you know, uh, look at other people's work in depth. So whenever I see something that's really cool, I take a screenshot and then I go back and analyze it. Uh, but it's it's more often than not that I like under, I know the people's art before I know their names, and I'll recognize somebody by their art or by their like face more so than their names. And that happens. It's the same thing with uh, like just people everywhere. Like if it, it's really difficult for me to like remember a lot of different names. Like, I'll forget your name half the time before, like, we stop saying the first couple sentences. Not necessarily something I'm proud of. It's just that it's very hard for me to, like, do that. But if you have a really cool facial feature, like, you know, like, a tattoo on your face or something, then I'll remember you forever. Because <laughs> I'll assign you a nickname right away. All right. Gabriel Glover said, next month I'm buying stuff for tamales, pozole, and menudo. And I think someone's bragging. I think so too. Wow. Kind of that that's kind of mean, not even an invite. Jesus. <laughs> it's making a man hungry. Vince Bernie George says, Does that tattoo on your hand mean something special? <laughs> uh my S. Uh okay. The S was supposed to say, like, skills, sketching, skating, and, like, some other stuff. Uh, I forget what it said. But it was because this hand was skilled, and this one wasn't. So this one was going to have an S, and this one was probably going to have a D. And since it was San Diego as well, it would have been said as D. So that was the concept behind it. But 
it didn't really uh, work out like that. But I still like it. And I just got to, like, draw, like, t- tattoos around it. So, but I'm, I'm not regretful of the, the design. All right, let's see. What else can we add? Gamer laughed at the aliens comment. Let's <laughs> add some green. Just a little bit of green to mix in with the blue. We'll just add a little bit of ambience to the scene. UniC asked, did you already do expressions? Oh, was I supposed to? Do? Oh, yeah, I was supposed to do expressions today. <laughs> I got so held, uh, caught up by just drawing a skeleton. Um, yeah, I'll draw some ske- I'm almost done with this. Pretty much done. We'll do some facial expressions right here. You know, to comply with the title of the, of the stream. <laughs> I really have to, like, think a little bit more through when I'm playing <laughs> these. Gabriel Glover said, for superpowers, I would say for myself, tech... Technomancy, power over electronics. Ooh, nice. That, at this time, I just don't time travel. Because <laughs> if you go back in time, you're not going to have a good time. <laughs> Drawing Gamer 93 said, indestructible skin like Luke Cage for me. All right. So, da da, we have our skeleton with armor, with a bone, arrows, and a dagger. Bam! Oh, and we have little birds in the background. And what else are they on? It looks a lot better in person. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, for those that you guys said you wanted to print, if you do still, let me know. Just send me a message on Instagram. We'll figure it out. So now we are going to do facial expressions. Yeah, you should do a photo on that. I think it's always hard to get like a good shot because like lighting glare. Yeah. Let's see if I can just rotate this. Wow. Okay, anyways. Facial expressions. So the three elements that I like to keep in mind whenever I'm drawing facial expressions are the following. Um, The parts that I believe are the most important are the eyebrows, the mouth, and the eyes. Why do I believe these are the parts that make up the facial expressions the most? These are the parts that move within a face. Yes, the nose can go from this and then like scrunch up a little bit. You know, it does have a little bit of like range depending on what you want to do. But for the most part, it's a very static play, I think. The ears as well. Ears don't really play a role when it comes down to like expressions. So these three elements are what I like to keep in mind. Now, with these three elements, you can break it down really, really quickly. If you have just, we're just going to keep a circle or a sphere for a basic shape for now. And then at another episode or something, we'll like go more in depth into like why the anatomy changes and stuff like that. But for a basic lecture on facial expressions, we keep these elements in mind. I like to approach my drawings with um, the mask method and the worm method. And what are those? Well, the mask method helps me choose where my drawing's face is going to be. And what I like to draw as a shape is something along the lines of this. Right? A lot of people like to do their drawings and they like to do like you know, mapping it out like that. I personally like to draw it like this. This provides me pretty much all the information that I need for the face. The upper line will define where the eyebrows are. This part right here determines where the nose bridge is, and this is where the nose would go. This divides and gives me cheekbones into where would be the mouth. And then the rest of the face just gets kind of filled in. John Gwillen said, not the destination, but the journey. 
Funny porn saw I four eight seven said atomic energy would be my superpower. It used to be morphing into different things. <laughs> Mr. No. DC said Christo does the cherry pin up, similar to Mandy and your art in a way. Amazing concept. Looks great from here. Nice. And we're caught up on comments for the moment. Alright, so keeping that in mind, keep the mask is a really, really helpful way to draw faces really quickly. When you go into three-quarter view, the mask would look something more like this. This this side would be a little bit smaller because you're seeing it in perspective. So the farther you get away from things, the skinnier and narrower they get. So if you see something from the front, it might look like that. And then it starts getting skinnier as you go to the side. So this side would be a little bit more narrow by making it that. This middle part right here provides us the nose bridge. The nose bridge leads to the eyebrow line, which is, again, established by that like, circumference on the outside. Then you can draw your eyes. And since you already drew your nose bridge, you know that that part's going to get blocked off. Again, if you just darken the upside part of the eye, it ends up looking like eyelashes a little bit. So it gives it a little bit of depth. From here, the nose comes out, but it still comes from the top and ranging down and into the mouth. Now, this same technique seen from a profile view would be something like that. And then you would just cut out this little section to represent that little indentation that happens in the front of the face. Now, the ear, for all of you that, you know, haven't like, you know, worked on your proportions and stuff, the ear is normally a little bit behind the middle line in the profile. A little bit more than the middle part. The back part of the head is not all that big. Okay, so this part behind the ear is just the back of the head. The back of the skull and the neck. And then everything else is in the front. Okay, uh, so that mask method has always, you know, like ever since I like started doing it like that, has helped me map out things really, really, really quickly. And you can change the shape of the mask. Let's say you just want like a more serious one. You would draw something like this, maybe even a little bit farther down. And then you have angry expressions. Right, it's the same idea as before when we're drawing the two shapes to create the eyeball but just even more simplified. Now, the other thing that I like to consider when I'm drawing facial expressions is the eyebrows. And the eyebrows, I like to keep them like, this is what I call the worm method. And what I mean by that is that eyebrows tend to look, if you work at them as a single element, you can get some really interesting shapes. Now, you draw them like that, you can draw the rest of your face. Right, and then you just fill in the parts that you want your eyebrows in. And then you would erase the rest. Obviously, that doesn't really work with a marker, but you get an idea of what I mean. Uh, you can do the same thing in three-quarter view. Eyebrow, eyebrow, nose bridge, mask, eye, eye, boom. Yay! This one looks a little derpy, but <laughs> you understand the concept. Uh, try that with a bunch of different shapes, like just play around with how it looks 
like when you create different facial expressions with adjusting the line, adjusting the little like, you know, like where the eyebrows sit within that line. And you can come up with a lot of really fun things. Uh, so I would suggest if you want to get into facial expressions and playing around a little bit more, play with those two elements first, master how those work within your drawings, and then move on to the mouth. Because the mouth in itself, uh, it requires an entire lesson. Because even though it's really relatively simple to think about it as like a rubber band and then drawing all the elements inside. Ian, it's very simple to think about it like that. I would really like to make more of an explanation as to why certain parts of the mouth protrude, how lips actually work, you know, how they come out of your face, and why so many people have so many problems drawing it. And I know that because I was one of those. But now, uh, understanding how they're structured and how they're made is has like been infinitely easier so i think we are almost done for today but if we have any more comments i would love to read them bernard de vince said hi hi nightshade said thank god i made it I love hooded characters, very mysterious, but I have a hard time with that aspect. Can you preview hooded steps? characters? Yeah, how you would go about that, please. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see. Hooded characters. And then Uni C said lips and teeth. I'll have to make a whole mouth one on itself because that's going to require like a good hour on its own. Uh, but what was the other one? Hooded, hooded characters. characters. Okay, so hoods. Um, essentially, they're just blankets over your head. Now, when you're drawing characters, if you think about it like you're drawing something getting wrapped around an object, let's say you have your little character right here, and we establish the mask really quickly, and we're going to make the eyes really small for this one. And then the nose. And then he's going to have a little smile like, hee hee hee. There you go. You're gonna have this guy be a little sneaky. He's gonna have a hood. Now, the face is a spherical shape, right? When you start cutting down like the different aspects of it, you know, you start seeing different, you know, planes of it. But when it comes down to hoods, they just go over this element. So if you trace around the shape. If you travel around and you draw through the object, right? You see the, imagine the lines that are on the other side. That, if it's a tight fitted hoodie, that's how you would draw them. They would match up right here. The neck would probably be poking a little bit, but you would draw around the character around the head of the character and that's how you would do like a tight fitted hoodie now if you wanted to do like a cloak like something like mysterious like a dementor or something like that you can start with the same shape and then just extend the top of it into another shape let's say you just want like a little skull dude since you're playing with anatomy and stuff Let's say we have a little skeleton, a little Grim Reaper there situation going on, and then we want a hood over him. So we determine the general shape that we want to draw. We find the dimensions to it, the sides to it, and then we're going to draw around that. Now, if we want the hood to be covering part of the person's face, just determine where the entry point would be for the hood for like, you know, where it connects to the body and then just create the shape that goes around it and then just trace over the backside of your character.
Now hoods normally tend to create shadows. So you, if you determine the light source, let's say from this part, it would create a shadow over your character. So you would only see a little bit of the eyes. And that's how you end up like, you know, creating hooded characters and cloak characters and assassins and stuff. Just come up with like a shape that overlaps the top of them and then just add to that. And then you get really cool hooded characters. Anything else? We're caught up. We are caught up. And with that, I am going to say goodbye to all you lovely people. Uh, once again, I am going to selflessly promote <laughs> my pinup book that will be released soon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just need to scan this and format and do what I do for a living, but for myself for once. So that's going to be coming soon. Hopefully uh, in the next coming weeks, I'll have a lot of updates on that. And uh, once I do a progressive part of it, then I will start taking pre-orders so that we can get them printed before uh, I'm, you know, like the holidays. So with that, let's recap on what we did today. We drew faces. We drew a little mushroom ghost we indicated a little bit of how to draw the face and to indicate different parts of the body and what different parts of the drawings mean whenever you're drawing in different sides we talked a little bit about how to determine what level of detail that you find yourself in and how to progress to the next level or at least how to guide yourself to get better if you find yourself stuck we drew a skeleton with uh, armor and birds, and a sword, and a bone, and a lot of arrows. And then we played a little bit with learning how to do facial expressions and how to map out the face really quickly if you just want to learn how to draw uh, just faces on anything. A little bit more about facial expressions, the rule of the worm rule, and a little bit of cloaks. And with that, we are going to call it a night. Thank you so much for keeping me company for, I don't know, an hour and a half this time. Wow. <laughs> uh, it didn't seem like that long to me. Uh, but time flies when you're having fun. So thank you all for keeping me company. You all have a wonderful night. And don't worry. These will be on YouTube like they all are a day after or even sooner than that. So make sure to give them a like and support and, you know, follow on Instagram as well if you don't. Subscribe. That helps. Get me to that bronze little checkpoint. I need all my followers from Instagram to give me likes and subscribes here so that I can get that and I can eventually become a YouTuber. Ah, oh, Maybe I can be a YouTuber. <laughs> well, Marianne, would you like to say something to the people? Uh, you're welcome, guys. Everybody's saying thank you. Have a good night yourselves. All right, you heard it from the beautiful goddess right here. Have a wonderful night, and you all have a fantastic time drawing, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.